Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 305 of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Patient Zero, an interview with Casey Fillion. My name is Richard Johannesson, and this is a special crossover podcast with our friends at Lime TV. And I thank Adina Berkowitz for sharing this interview with me. Folks, we named this episode Patient Zero because Casey Fillion is one of the earliest people diagnosed with Lyme disease. Although she's in her mid-40s now, she's actually been managing Lyme disease since she got sick at the age of eight. In fact, when she was initially sick and diagnosed at eight years old, her doctor didn't even know what she was diagnosed with, but he recognized the similarity of, of the symptoms between what she was suffering and what the Lyme cluster was in Connecticut and sent Casey and her parents to Yale University for treatment. It was made clear to her that she needed to be careful with her diet and her fitness, and everything went well for Casey until very recently. Two things happened that caused Casey to have a relapse. The first is that she went from being somebody who was fit to being maybe a little too fit and she was training for a marathon. While she was training for a marathon, she got bitten by a tick and the combination of her being immunocompromised because of the work that she was doing for training for the marathon and the tick bite triggered her to suffer a relapse. Folks, this is a really cool interview. I think you're really going to enjoy watching someone who has been dealing with Lyme disease and managing Lyme disease for close to 40 years and what you need to do to make sure that you can have as good an experience with Lyme as Casey has and make sure that you're really careful with your diet, your exercise, and checking for ticks. Without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce Patient Zero. Hey, Casey Philly, and welcome to the Tick Bootcamp Podcast. Thank you so much. It's awesome to be here. And it is awesome that you've been kind enough to take time out of your really busy schedule uh, to be with us today. But even more awesome is that I have a special guest co-host today, uh, the superstar Lyme disease advocate from Lyme TV, Adina Berkowitz. Adina, please say hi to folks. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rich and Tick Bootcamp for having me co-host today. And I'm very excited to interview Casey. Well, thank you. And, and we're really excited to have you as a co-host and have this special crossover between Tick Boot Camp and Lime TV. Really cool stuff. So, uh, Casey, folks, um, are of course, going to want to know where you're uh, calling in from. So why don't you first share with us where you're from? I'm actually from uh, the Jersey Shore, good old New Jersey. Grew up um, pretty close to the beach near the Asbury Park area. Uh, we've moved a little inland now, um, moving toward West New Jersey, but born and raised in Jersey all my life. All right. So the Jersey gal who uh, was uh, raised close to the uh, the the hometown of uh, Bruce Springsteen, uh, of course, uh, was growing up as a child in the Lime Belt, right? I mean, you grew up uh, in Tick Central, and and as we know, uh, there are tons of ticks uh, on the Jersey Shore, and uh, and. And, and unfortunately, when we recreate in places where there are a lot of ticks, it's very likely that we're going to come in contact with ticks. So, Casey, you want to talk to us about what you knew about ticks and tick diseases uh, during your childhood? Did you receive any education from, you know, from the school system or from your parents that uh, put you in a position where when you were enjoying the outdoors um, on, at the beautiful Jersey Shore, one of the most beautiful places in the world, uh, were you able to keep yourself safe? So growing up in the late 70s and the early 80s, um, tick-borne disease and illness wasn't really a thing. Uh, we didn't fear ticks. We didn't know that they could carry disease with lifelong consequences like we know now. Um, so for me, I wasn't really fearful of getting a tick bite. Um, and it really wasn't an issue until later on when people were educated and started to realize the severity of of what a tick could do so i have to tell you casey it's kind of shocking that you're sharing with me that you growing up in the late 70s and the early 80s because that's when i grew up and you know and you, you look so much better than me that i i'm shocked to see that you know we are we are somewhat close in age although i am a bit older than you and and i have shared with folks on this podcast I had exactly the same experience, right? I grew up in the late 70s and the early 80s, and and um, and ticks were a huge part of my life on Long Island. But you know, one of the downsides to our experiences, Casey, is that is that we were interacting with ticks and we were getting bitten by ticks even before the Lyme bacteria had been allegedly discovered, right? So it was really something that we dealt with. There were ticks, we were getting bitten, but it wasn't something that we were really anxious about. And I'm wondering whether or not your experience is the same as mine, is we were much more aware, well, we were aware of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. People were getting bitten by ticks, and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever was the disease that we were concerned about 
protecting ourselves from. Were you, did you have that same experience on the Jersey Shore? Yeah, that was really the only disease that I had ever heard of being tick transmitted. So I didn't have any real fear. Like I said, if I had a, 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 you know, a friend who got a tick bite or if my animal came in with a tick, which happened very often, there wasn't that, that panic surrounding it. Um, that obviously came later. Okay, so talk to us about what, what your experience was like on the Jersey Shore growing up. Let's, let's take it away from the, the tick experience and just talk about what it was like to grow up on the Jersey Shore and what that experience was like. So, like I said, growing up in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, in, in my area, um, you had the shore and you also had a lot of small towns. It wasn't nearly as populated um, as it is now, you know, 40 years later. Um, so we had a lot of farmlands in my backyard there was literally a big farm where we got our milk delivered to our back, you know, doorstep, um, cows, horses, um, a, a, just a lot of open area, a lot of fields. Um, and, you know, we were outside all the time. There wasn't a lot of traffic. So we were in the streets and, you know, like they say, when the street light came on, you knew it was time to go home. So there was a lot of freedom growing up at the Jersey Shore because even though there were a lot of people, it wasn't as busy as it has now become. It was a great childhood. I, I, have, I have no regrets or, or, you know, wouldn't want to change a thing. I mean, that part of New Jersey is some of the most beautiful country literally in the world. I mean, folks who are listening to us around the world uh, probably wouldn't know that, but even those of us who grew up on Long Island, which is a beautiful place, most of us vacation on the Jersey Shore because it's an even more beautiful place. I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful environment. And it's a place that you feel called to go out to yes. and spend time. And so you are spending a lot of time outdoors and doing the things that people do in these in these beautiful communities. And so what, what kinds of things were you dreaming about? I mean, what did you think your future was going to be during your childhood? And what was it that you were working towards? So I think for me during my childhood, um, I loved being outside. So I knew for me that anything that I was going to do in my life was going to be something that revolved around maybe being um, outdoors, exercise, um, recreation. That was always something that I enjoyed. I loved walking and hiking, even as a kid, you know, walking through the fields and the meadows and, and, and finding bugs and bringing home stray animals. I mean, I loved to be outside and I love to ride a bike and I love to run around with my neighborhood friends. Um, I think being indoors for me, I always felt stifled. I would be outside as long as the sun was up and my mother wasn't calling me in. I really enjoyed that. So you always had a passion for the outdoors. You always had a passion for fitness. And, 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 uh, and of course, anybody who has been on your Instagram page would be able to tell that you're very fit. And that's been a big part of your life, right? And fitness and, and that, and from a very early age, you had a passion for, um, for outdoors life and for fitness. So let's talk about your first tick bite, right? Because you have a, an interesting story in that you have both a childhood tick bite and an adult tick bite. So let's talk about your first tick bite and what that experience was like. Well, it was uh, the summer of 1984 and I was at a, um, a camp, a, a day camp in Freehold, New Jersey, which is a little more inland than the immediate shore. And uh, we were outside again all the time, archery and you know arts and craft, everything was outside, picnicking and hiking. And um, I came down with an, an illness, a, a typical childhood illness, right? You know, sore throat, fever, um, that started it. And then about a week into it, I had a rash along my torso area, upper chest back. We figured not a big deal, right? Every kid at eight years old comes down with something. So we kind of waited for that to pass, never went to the doctor but knew that I needed to stay home for a couple of days from camp. My parents sent me back to camp later on, I think the following week, because I was down and out for a little bit. But I just remember complaining to my parents that I just didn't feel right. I didn't feel good. I didn't feel right. Um, and that went on for quite a while until the morning that I woke up several weeks later and I couldn't walk. I couldn't put any weight on my right leg. And I was terrified. I walked into the living room. I'll never forget it. 
I had a, a, a nightgown on and I told my mom I couldn't walk. She put me down on the carpet in the living room, pulled up my nightgown to expose my knee because I told her the pain in my knee was uh, pretty severe. And my knee was about four times the size of my other one. And immediately she looked at me and she said, do you remember falling? Do you remember injuring this? This is, this is not normal. And I, I shook my head no. And that was the beginning of, of unraveling the mystery. But at that point, we didn't put that quote unquote childhood illness together with the knee quote unquote injury. It was, you know, a game of connecting the dots after that. Okay, so let's pause there for a second because, you know, we've, we've done a number of different podcasts where um, children have gone to camp. They were bitten by a tick and they became chronically ill. I mean, you know, we, we've had some we've had some very powerful stories about about summer camps. And, you know, in most cases, we think of summer camp as a place where we're going to have, you know, a really positive experience. We're going to be in a safe environment where, um, you know, we're going to be learning. And, um, you know, I, I don't think most people think that summer camps are dangerous. It's a place where, you know, where you, you could you could ultimately become chronically ill. So talk to us about your summer camp experience in particular and whether or not your camp gave you the tools you needed to be safe while you were engaging in these recreational activities. And if not, what would you recommend to camp counselors and, and camp companies that are providing children with these experiences? So, uh, you know, 1984, tick prevention, tick bite prevention, it was a non-issue. I don't recall ever a time being told to dress, you know, in layers, long sleeves or, um, you know, uh, lighter colors to be able to see a tick on, on your clothing. I don't recall being encouraged to use, you know, bug spray or to seek shelter in, a, a, in an area that there's, you know, a, a tick infestation. I don't recall ever um, being told that this could be a, a serious consequence of a tick bite or um, being told to be careful, be cautious. I can say, obviously, now looking back on that, um, my advice to anybody who either runs a camp or, uh, you know, does anything that has children outside would be, you know, socks, high socks, even in, even in the summer, even in the heat of the summer light colored clothing and clothing again with sleeves or possibly long pants if you know it allows because that's i think the difference between forbid getting a tick bite and not knowing it and possibly being able to see it and in before it becomes an issue so talking to kids about tick prevention is is crucial now so uh, one of the things I want to do is pause here for a second and ask Adina to uh, to um, share some uh, some resources that Line TV and the T and and the uh, Tick Jedi program can offer to families in camps so that their children can be uh, tick safe. So Adina, why don't you just uh, join us here for a second? Oh, thanks, Rich, for that plug-in. <laughs> um, absolutely, Casey, I agree with you, and I appreciate you being such an advocate for tick-borne disease prevention because it is key to reducing the incidence of these dangerous diseases. Uh, Lyme TV is a nonprofit, a public health nonprofit, and our mission is all about tick-borne disease prevention. Um, so we have community outreach programs as well as youth education programs that target uh, schools, camps, and other organizations with free tick bite prevention resources. We also launched a lobbying nonprofit, a 501c4, in December of this past year, uh, which has gained a lot of traction very quickly. Uh, it's called the Tick Jedi Coalition, and it is a coalition of six, or currently now even 17. We just had a new member that's not on the website yet that uh, we're waiting uh, for them to send their information, but now 17 organizations, tick-borne disease organizations nationwide that are working together as a coalition with a single mission of championing tick-borne disease education safety, uh, tick safety education in the mainstream K-12 health sciences curriculum. So we are working on uh, ensuring that schools across the nation teach children as a life skill all about tick safety. 
So you see, Casey, if you had the skill set that um, that would be available to you through the education and training from programs like the Tick Jedi program, you wouldn't have gotten sick, right? I mean, it's very likely that because because tick diseases are diseases of exposure, Lyme disease is a disease of exposure. If if you were if you were empowered with the tools that um, that programs like the Tick Jedi program and Lyme TV could have offered to you, and you would have either stop the tick from coming on to you in the first place so you found it before it had bitten you or engage in early intervention behaviors shortly after it had bitten you then you probably wouldn't have gotten sick and unfortunately we wouldn't have met one another but we would well if we did we wouldn't have been meeting and having a conversation about these kinds of challenges so give me your thoughts about that yeah i mean this is this is life-altering information that um is now available to uh people to children to parents to educators and the more they uh, more the more people can know and understand um about tick prevention and ultimately tick-borne diseases um i think the better because the lack of education 40 years ago and the lack of of knowledge um that you know was around at that point was pretty much the difference in me getting treated right away and with a little bit of hesitation until the diagnosis was there so i think all in all education is our best weapon and tool so now talk about how your life changed after this tick bite experience from camp and what kinds of things you had to do um after um after you got sick so it was uh, life altering as far as my entire third grade um, year was pretty much cut up into many different pieces. Um, I got sicker and sicker as the summer went on. Um, and then by the time October hit and we got a, an official diagnosis from Yale University Hospital in Connecticut where I was sent we were then brought back to the shore area. I was hospitalized for the months of November and a portion of December um, in order to get my septic, because by this point I was considered septic, my septic line, um, you know, uh, uh, under wraps and, and in remission as they called it back then. Um, and then after that, after I was released from the hospital, I didn't go back to school right away because I was a little too sick to really get in there and put in a seven hour day. Um, so it was a really difficult struggle the whole year after my Lyme diagnosis of just being a kid again, getting my strength back, um, getting my leg back. I hadn't really walked much. Um, and then just that general malaise that that fatigue and that feeling. I remember that lingering for quite some time. So let's talk about your diagnosis because it's really, I mean, an unbelievable blessing that in 1984, you get a Lyme disease diagnosis when in 2022, it's almost impossible to get a diagnosis when people have very similar symptoms to what you have. So talk to us about, you know, what doctors you went to and how they ultimately diagnosed you and then sent you over to Yale University. So like I said, with that Lyme arthritis in the knee, we initially thought it was an injury. So my parents took me to an orthopedic and a couple of other doctors thinking that we had an injury specific scenario. X-rays, this and that showed nothing, just this massive knee filled with fluid. So uh, basically shopped around a little bit, trying to connect the dots. My mother said, I'm going to my pediatrician whom she trusted. I'm going, I'm going to him. Let's just see what he says. He comes in the room. He takes a look at me. He asks my mom a couple of questions. Has she had anything else, any type of illness, anything with fevers or fatigue or a rash? Bingo. That's when we started to think about the weeks prior to the knee that I had had that, that illness. He said, I think she might have something called Lyme disease, but we don't really see this in New Jersey. I'm gonna send you to Old Lyme, Connecticut. I'm gonna send you to some doctors there that are really looking at these kids that are sick. And, and we're gonna see if that's what she has. The following week, weekend, we went to Connecticut and I spent that weekend in Yale University Hospital with like the best of the best doctors, which I'm, super blessed and super lucky to have had access to um i kind of 
remember feeling like a specimen, people coming in, looking at me and poking and prodding and uh, a lot of blood work and all sorts of not fun things for a child. And ultimately, that's when we got the diagnosis of septic Lyme disease, um, pretty much um, on the spot. It was, I believe, the following day my parents got the phone call. And um, we kind of coordinated with the doctors here. And we started on an oral medication. But by that point, I was really too ill and subsequently had to be hospitalized right after. So, so Casey, I think this is another one of the sort of blessings we have to count you know, not only did you get a diagnosis in 1984, which is just right. unbelievable. Uh, you know, you had this, you had this, you know, unbelievably um, enlightened pediatrician um, who was aware of something that was newly developing at that time, right? Because we had these wonderful moms in, in Lyme and Old Lyme, Connecticut, who saw all of their children getting sick, right? And Polly Murray, who was a former um, World Health Organization employee, knew what what clusters look like knew that all these kids shouldn't be you know suffering from juvenile um arthritis and as a result of her jumping up and down yale university came in and and conducted their research and i mean the, the you know the, the the blessing you have of course is that you had what was then a very traditional presentation because you had the arthritic condition because your condition matched the condition that they were examining at that time, you had the blessing of now being able to go and work with folks who were doing some groundbreaking research at the time and, and, and get treated, which is really unbelievable. I mean, just, this, this, that's just crazy. Yes, I feel so blessed. I mean, my, my, my pediatrician, God rest his soul, was an amazing, amazing doctor. And it was almost like a light bulb moment. I remember being in the office and again, I was young, but it was such an impressionable time for me. And I remember a lot, I've blocked out quite a bit as well, but I do remember a lot of that initial phase of, of getting the diagnosis and, and being shuffled around between hospitals and doctors and such. And I remember he was so insistent to my mother that, this is not something we see here. This is not a New Jersey thing. So I got to send you away so that we can figure out if this is indeed, you know, penetrating and infiltrating our area and, and, and you know, making our children here sick. Um, so I'm, I'm so grateful that we had his uh, professionalism and his knowledge to kind of guide us toward a diagnosis. Yeah, and, and of course he was also brave, right? He was he was willing to step out of the box and and he was willing to come up, come to uh, a place where you could be diagnosed and then referred to a place where you could get the treatment, right? And you're right. We did hear juvenile arthritis in August and September. Oh, it's juvenile arthritis, but every blood test did not reflect juvenile arthritis. And, you know, the knee and the swelling and, and everything else, everything just kept getting worse. So we knew we had something else going on. So you go to Yale, uh, they give you uh, your, uh, your preliminary treatment. You have this long you know, journey during this early phase of your life. So how did things go from there? Were you, were, did you feel better? Did you not feel better? And, and how is this now impacting your childhood? So initially, you know, coming back, like I said, I, uh, I was in the hospital for uh, over a month getting treated. Um, it, after my treatment for Lyme disease, the protocol was you know, antibiotics, right? They kept telling my mother, she'll probably be in here for a couple of days. We'll get her on an IV antibiotic and she'll go home. Three days, five days, seven days, 14 days, 21 days. I was not getting any better. Um, I had my knee aspirated 13 times while I was in the hospital as a child. Um, I had locked jaw and I could barely walk some days. Um, I couldn't move any of my joints, my hands, my hips, my, I remember just feeling of almost like a toy soldier, couldn't bend anything, couldn't do much. And when I finally finished my quote unquote protocol and I was well enough to go home, I was never really the same after that. My immune system never functioned the same. I was a very healthy child until the age of eight. After that, during cold and flu season or um, during typical childhood illnesses, mine were always exacerbated. They were always 
longer, harder, worse. Um, I was diagnosed with a cardiac issue. Um, I had some uh, evidence of POTS and a slowing of the heart, which was a diagnosis of bradycardia. Things that I was not born with, things that I don't believe um, were part of my life until my Lyme disease diagnosis. So, Casey, okay, so you are you're now an immunocompromised young person. Um, Correct. You, know, you you shared with us you've always had this passion for fitness, uh, passion for uh, for being in the outdoors. How are your developing symptoms now impacting that uh, phase of your life? I think the developing symptoms were um, kind of you know, a double-edged sword, let's say, because I knew that I had some limitations physically, especially because my knee was not the same post, uh, you know, my Lyme treatment. I had um, a lot of uh, cartilage uh, loss from the Lyme disease in the knee. So I wore this brace and I tried to get around and I participated in sports and I ran and I was a cheerleader. And I knew in order to keep my heart functioning well, because I did now have what was considered a, a, um, a heart issue as a child. I knew I needed to be active and I needed to be fit, but it wasn't always easy because I was always in pain. So I started going to the gym, believe it or not, with my mom, who my mom has been my rock and my biggest advocate and my angel on my shoulder. She brought me to the gym in our neighborhood when I was about 15 years old, just to keep me strong and to keep me moving. And, and I, I fell in love with fitness and the gym atmosphere. And that actually led me to a 28 year, um, you know, fitness journey and actually what became my lifelong career. Okay. So, um, I hear that you're, you are a cheerleader and of course, uh, folks who are, uh, aware of the uh, of the national cheer scene of some of the top cheerleading teams are from the Jersey Shore. I, I actually had daughters who were uh, national high school cheerleading champions. So we always had some rivalries going on between our Long Island teams and New Jersey Shore team. So talk about how the, that element of your of your life where you were you were a an early fitness enthusiast was driven by a desire to be healthy, right? I mean, you knew you had to move. And yes, and, and, and I guess the second question I have for you is, were any of your doctors encouraging you to be active? And, and did you know that that was going to be a vital part of staying healthy? Because one of the things we learned from Dr. Burascano, who's one of the Lyme pioneers who was doing work here on Long Island in the late 70s and early 80s, was that he had discovered that if movement was not a part of the um, experience of Lyme patients, they would not get better. You must move. And we'll talk a little bit about fitness because you're a fitness professional, but talk to us about about that element of your journey and whether or not this is something that you instinctively um, were, were, were doing so that you would stay healthy and, 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 um, and try to do your best to um, make yourself as uh, immune healthy as possible? Or was this something your doctors were encouraging you to do? Doctors did not encourage us to keep moving. Again, I don't think it was really understood how imperative it was for patients with Lyme, like you said, to move and remain mobile. Um, but I had that inner desire from childhood to, to, to run and go and move and do. And I also, in the back of my mind, I think going to the cardiologist as a child and finding out that there was an issue um, it, it made me realize that I really need to make sure that I offset this disease and, and, and you know, never undo the damage because I don't know if, if that's a possibility and I didn't think it was then. But I knew going forward, if I wanted to live my best life, I had to really take care of myself. So, you know, uh, high school sports, coupled with everything that I did on the outside, I felt like made a difference for me. And I knew in my heart that if I wanted to, you know, be healthy, be strong, and to also, I think, overcome the obstacles that I faced as a child, it, it drove me. It, it made me stubborn in the best way. I really just wanted to be healthy. And that's what I, that's what I did. Okay. So 
Now let's let's talk a little bit about what else you are doing to stay healthy, right? Because again, you're, you're a young child, you get bitten by a tick, you're, you're on this journey where you're, you're, you're having these challenges with your health, that's impacting your ability to go to school, it's impacting your ability to be outdoorsy, certainly impacting your ability to be a competitive athlete. So you're having these, these, uh, these challenges, you're overcoming them, you're gritting through them, you're, you're working through them. Um, what were you doing to keep yourself tech safe at that time? I mean, you, you knew that this illness was generated by, um, by a tick bite. Uh, what kinds of things were you doing now to keep yourself from getting reinfected? That was a, a big part of my story because I would talk to people a lot about, you know, when we were running or when we were outside, I'm in pants, it's 90 degrees. I would explain to people, I'm in pants because I got a tick bite when I was eight and it changed the course of my life. So I was really careful. Um, we were really, um, we were kind of on the cutting edge um, of a lot of, the new um, insect sprays and, and tick repellents. So my mom would go to different places and find the, the latest, greatest tick repellents to spray. There was um, a lot of myths circulating and some could be true, right? Drier sheets in your clothing to repel uh, when, when the wristbands came out that had the tick repellents on them. I wore those. I was, I was a, a very, big advocate for anything that would keep me and anybody I knew away from the possibility or the realm of getting a tick bite and getting sick. So I, I did a lot of preaching to people and I, ex I explained my story and I explained what happened because I knew that it could impact you and your health if you do get sick. So I thought and um, <laughs> I tried to make sure that I was safe and to, uh, you know, spread the word to others around me. Okay, but now, now let's take the next step in your story, right? Because yeah. the best laid plans, talk about your second tick bite. I was a runner and I had raced a lot of half marathons, marathons, road races, trail races. I'm a hiker. I love to be with my dog out in the middle of nowhere. I thought I was being safe. Um, I was training for the New Jersey half marathon on Sandy Hook in 2017. And I came in from running and I found a couple of ticks crawling up my socks. I plucked them out, took my socks down and put everything, you know, washer dryer, you know, try to kill everything right in the shower, check everything. And I must have missed one because a few days later, I felt a tick um, embedded in my hip. And when I asked my son to help me pull it out, um, we actually did not get the whole thing out. And I went right to the doctor and he said, let's just see what happens. Don't panic. Uh, but I knew in the back of my mind, I had that feeling that I should panic only because I knew what could happen. Um, panic a little bit, but uh, I went home, didn't start on anything preventative, no doxy, no antibiotic, no nothing. I just tried to think positive and hope for the best. And within two weeks, I had a bullseye rash on my back. And I... So let's, let's pause there. Yeah. So, um, and Adina is going to be picking up in a couple of seconds to talk about your post bite experience, but I want to talk about the bite itself and the steps yeah. you took, uh, with the bite. So, um, you're um, somebody who is, whose life has now been altered as a result of being one of the earliest Lyme disease patients in the world, right? You, yes. You've had this whole experience during your childhood where um, where um, you've had you know to deal with being immunocompromised, but of course you're taking some steps to be healthy. And um, and you're now becoming a, a fitness enthusiast and now a, even a, you know, a, a marathon uh, athlete. Yes. And um, and now you get bitten by another tick. Is there anything you could have done differently? Do you think at that time that would have prevented you from having that second tick bite experience? I do wish I would have stayed clear of wooded areas. Um, the training that I was doing 
in areas that were unsafe, that I had come in prior with ticks on me and knew better because like I said, I had come in from multiple runs and hikes with ticks on me or my dog. And I think if I had it to do all over again, one and done, if I had gone to an area, come in with a tick on me, I don't think I would have frequented that area um, anymore. Okay. And well, that, that you know, and, and one of the things that I, I certainly want to encourage our folks uh, to do is not to be afraid of going into the outdoors, not to be afraid of engaging in fitness activities, but to do it in a way that's going to be safe, right? And and um, so one of the things you could do is certainly avoid an area or avoid being outside altogether. But are there other things that you might have done that uh, that would have put you in a position where it's less likely that you would have been bitten by a tick? You know, I think a lot of it too um, would have been for me, you know, I don't think I checked as thoroughly as I should have. And I have a lot of regret about that. I would scan quickly, but I don't think I did a thorough tick check each and every single time. Had I been more thorough, I think that again coupled with the places that i was going where there were big signs that said tick infested areas perhaps i shouldn't have gone maybe as deep into the woods as i had again coupled with a more thorough check i think i would have been better off so checking thoroughly is so important i can't stress it enough having somebody look you over in addition to yourself mirrors lights um, i think that that would have also been a big help so one of the things I've shared with folks on our podcast is uh, because I grew up in a tick infested community, because I had ticks biting me all the time during my childhood, and because I had this really aggressive Italian mother who was really honest about tick checks, um, you know, it became a part of our culture. Yeah. So I've actually been doing tick checks every morning and every night for almost my entire life. Right. I mean, to this day, I'm, I'm an old man. And and when I disrobe and go into the shower, I do a tick check using my fingers, not just my eyes, but my fingers, because your fingertips will put you in a position where you can find something that is that is attached to you. And so when you make it a part of sort of the habit of grooming yourself where you're showering or for me, before I go to bed again, I take off my clothing before I put on my pajamas, I, I check myself. Those tools, of course, put you in a position where and doing it correctly puts you in a position where you're more likely to find a tick before it's biting you. And um, and if you are being bitten, of course, um, you know you can you can find it long before it's putting you in a position where uh, you're likely to get sick. But it, there's one more thing I want to explore with you before Adina um, begins to uh, uh, ask you some questions. And that is, do you believe that the level of fitness activity you are engaging in? perhaps made you vulnerable. Because one of the things that we've learned from Dr. Biroscano again, is that when you're engaging in extreme exercise, largely extreme cardiovascular exercise, that our T cell counts are lower and, we, and our immune system doesn't function as effectively. Do you think because you were training for an extreme running event that perhaps you were immunocompromised and that made it more likely that the tick bite um, made you sick? Absolutely. A hundred percent. And I know that now, and I'm sure we'll get to it um, because of what I'm dealing with currently. I believe that there's got to be a um, happy medium. And especially with an immunocompromised individual, I think I was pushing the envelope. I think that my body was tired and fatigued and perhaps somebody that wasn't in that uh, state could have maybe fought it off a little bit better than I had. Um, I definitely, if I had it to do over again, probably would have scaled down. So Casey, let's talk about that balance though, right? I mean, because you were bitten by a tick as a child, because you had you had this, uh, this journey as a young child and you recognized instinctively and through the support of your family that exercise was an important part of your life. It had to be become part of your lifestyle. Do you think because you had that experience as a child and it was such a, you know, such a powerful, left such a powerful impression on you that it took you to the extremes of fitness because you thought fitness is a good thing. It'll keep me heart healthy. It'll keep me healthy. And then you just pushed it too far because of that impression you had as a child. 
Definitely. And I, again, I told you, I have that stubborn side of me that I've got something to prove and I was going to conquer this and I was going to do that. And, and I have no regrets as far as where fitness led me to the, to the friendships and the people and the relationships. I, I wound up owning a, a, a spin studio and a TRX studio. And I worked all over the world teaching and with the great people. And I enjoyed what I did, but I, I wish that I had known that I didn't have anything to prove, not to myself or not to anybody else. And that I would have found a little bit more of a balance. I, I knew in my head that my body was not a hundred percent. And I wish I had listened to the warning to just slow down. Okay, and we're, gonna, we're gonna spend more time talking about signals because that's a really important part of this, but I'm gonna let Adina take you through that. I'm gonna ask you one, one last question and that is about reinfection. Do you believe as a result of your early infection, and you may have been bitten by ticks many times when you were a child, but of course you have that memorable event when you were eight years old and that caused you to become sick. But do you believe that the second tick bite that caused you to become chronically ill in your adult life, do you think that just sort of added to what your body was already harboring and really what was happening at that time was your body was able to balance the bacteria and all of the tick um you know diseases that were in your body and what this did is essentially just sort of boiled over to use you know dr rawls's metaphor uh like the tick bite was really something that sort of boiled over and you and it took your body out of balance and that's why you became so sick despite the short period of time that the tick had been biting you i became extremely ill with the second bite extremely i i got uh, sepsis. So I was hospitalized and I had not only Lyme disease, but Bartonella and sepsis. I had to uh, get a pick line in order to be infused daily for three months. I was extremely ill. And I do believe that that second bite put me over the edge. Um, not only did I get blood sepsis, but I got septic arthritis of the hip and back. So I did have to have a total hip replacement. Um, at 46 years old, I right now have a pick line in my arm uh, getting um, infusions because I'm still considered septic right now. I've had a lot of health issues from this second tick bite, and I believe it 100% put me over the edge. All right. Thank you, Casey, for sharing your personal health challenges today with us. My son is now in the third grade. And so it's heartbreaking to think about him going through the health decline that you went through at such a young age. And having gone through your Lyme diagnosis in your early years after, you know, in the early years that Lyme was discovered, that the bacterium was discovered as a causative agent of Lyme disease, it really, I think, took a great clinician, your, you said your pediatric primary care, uh, to not diagnose you with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis based solely on clinical presentation, even without a negative lab test, because sometimes clinicians may still diagnose that on, on presentation alone. And I think having a good clinician obviously made all the difference in your case. Can you please walk us through the steps taken for your treatment in your recovery journey as a child when you were in the hospital? I know you said your knee was aspirated 13 times. What kind of treatment path did they put you on and what do you think helped make you feel better during that period? So initially it was oral antibiotics that did not work um, in the hospital. Then it became an array of different antibiotics. I know that they tried penicillin, amoxicillin. Back then, I don't believe Rocephin was my second time, but I know that they experimented with several different types of antibiotic um, intravenously. They did also experiment with um, dosages and they would change sometimes um, the dose and the times of the medication and the, and the drip because I remember it kind of being a revolving door in my hospital room um, quite a bit. And I think there was one specific that 
that one specific drug, and I don't recall what it was, but that started to um, kick a little bit of that um, that recovery into gear uh, toward the end of my hospitalization. When I did go home, I did continue to take oral antibiotic, and I did have to have my knee, the effusion, the uh, aspiration done after the hospital one time as well. Um, so it was slow and steady progress. And after that, I, I, I think a lot of it was just experimental, right? To figure out how to get, especially for my mother, how to get my child back to where she was. It's interesting that clinicians then used so many IV cephalosporin antibiotics that actually kill the bacteria itself. And now the recommended dose is a tetracycline and doxycycline, which just inhibits the bacterial growth and may be not as effective in some patients, especially if they were diagnosed late stage. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting to hear that early on when Lyme was first discovered, how, how those um, treatment paths from clinicians have changed over the course of decades as well for, for patients. So um, how are you now treating as an adult? Is it any different? Right now, I'm treating uh, via a PICC line with um, azithromycin. So I have my little pick line in my arm right now. And um, we're doing the azithromycin for 30 days. Um, this is my treatment protocol post um, total hip arthroplasty, which I had just 12 short weeks ago. And we're doing this because my bacterial levels remain extremely high. And um, my Bartonella has been an ongoing issue as well. So in order to preserve, hopefully, the rest of my joints from arthritis and just to get my pain level down because my inflammation, for me, Lyme disease hit me in the bones. Lyme disease got my joints. I think the more I talk to people who have gone through Lyme, it's almost like a lot of them get attacked in one area of their body. I know it's a multi-system um, scenario, but for some people, Lyme kind of goes to one weak area. And for me, it's the skeletal system. And arthritis has been the byproduct of Lyme disease for me as a patient. So that's the protocol now. Um, just trying to hopefully uh, get my, my, my bacteria under control enough where I can have quality of life and movement and motion in my joints. Because right now, I don't really have much. Uh, your hip replacement reminds me a little bit of Megan Bradshaw. Have you heard of Megan Bradshaw, the bionic I, woman? No, I have not. She's actually on Lyme TV's board and also on the Picted Eye Coalition's board. Uh, she has had numerous uh, hip replacements, uh, ankle replacements, knee replacements because of Lyme destroying her joints as well. Uh, and different strains of Lyme bacteria, there's different species and strains, right? We know that different strains of the bacteria that causes Lyme, it's especially in different regions around the world, can affect the system in different ways. So there's uh, strains in Europe that are, uh, you know, they affect more the neurological system, and then there are strains that affect more the skeletal system and so on. So you very likely had a different strain with your second bite as with the first, and you said it was a more severe case, and, and we know that the strains could cause different, you know, severity levels as well. So um, that's very possible. Being, um, being such a young child and losing your health at that point did that in any way lead, uh, give you a sense of empowerment as an adult in dealing with health decline as well? Did it give you um, any sense of, I know you said that you, you always want to um, prove yourself, right? Did, did that lead to uh, needing to prove yourself to, as an adult to get through this path as well or, or give you the tools that you needed to do this journey again? 
Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, initially you think, how is this happening again? How is lightning striking twice? Um, but I kept thinking to myself, <laughs> my misery is going to be my ministry and my test is going to be my testimony because if I don't talk about this and, and bring some sort of good out of such an awful situation, then nobody's going to get help and everything that I'm going through is going to be in vain. If I can help somebody, if I can help educate or if I can help bring it to light again, the severity of, of tick-borne disease, then what I'm going through might help somebody else. But I, I, I initially was, I think, in shock that this was happening again. Um, but I'm really determined to just, you know, get as much of my life back as possible and to keep fighting and to keep doing things that are um, going to help facilitate healing, whether it's diet, whether it's exercise, I, I'm I'm willing to to go there and to try it, but I'm I'm determined to do as much as I can with what I'm given right now. You also mentioned that when when you had your first bottle of wine when you were a child, that you had some hot like symptoms early in your journey. Do you still have any of those now? And if so, have you ever been through a neurological workup for autonomic dysfunction? I have not. I have not. And there have been some things that have manifested um, lately that um, my, my eyesight, I, um, I'm noticing certain things. Um, I have a little bit of a head twitch that I've never had before. So there are some, there are some red lights, there are some red flags. And I, I have thought to myself that it's probably time for myself and for possibly, you know, other people again, in education to, to find out if there's anything else going on so that we can know what Lyme disease looks like 40 years later so that clinicians and, 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 and medical uh, doctors and such can know this is somebody who presented with Borrelia 40 years ago and again, you know, five short years ago. And, and this is, you know, what we see in the brain or in the spinal cord. It's something that I've definitely thought about pursuing um, now that I'm, again, one of the oldest diagnoses in Monmouth County. Yeah, clinical education is definitely lacking, unfortunately, but as, uh, as with a lot of diseases throughout history, right, Lyme is not uh, an outlier in that regard. There are many diseases that go through this paradigm shift of knowledge uh, where, you know, clinicians end up knowing more when it's way too late, kind of. Um, so, yeah, I, I would encourage you to, you know, seek a workup with neurology if, if those kind of symptom sets are concerning and, and still bothering you. Um, I wanted to kind of step back again, going from uh, your neurological symptoms then to uh, your refract to your Lyme arthritis. Uh, so there are some studies showing that refractory Lyme arthritis uh, and Lyme disease can be treated with disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs uh, if the antibiotics are not working or did not work in that particular patient. Has your clinicians or have any of your clinicians tried that kind of uh, drug type with you? have not gone that protocol. The only thing that we've really done has been post arthritis. So the, the meloxicam, the, the medications that are supposed to help joint pain, neuropathy, Lyrica, that kind of route. When everything was already established, we kind of did everything to numb it to um, from intraarticular injections to um, you know, but physical therapy, but but nothing that you had mentioned. So I kind of, you know, I I hope that people would investigate that further. Um, unfortunately, I became bone on bone, and my cartilage was eaten away. So I didn't have much of a choice as far as things went, but I, I encourage people who are going through arthritis and who um, have arthritis post Lyme infection to really explore all options to prevent the furthering or the further spread of Lyme arthritis because 
it definitely can rob your quality of life. The, the constant pain that is associated with uh, arthritis is pretty debilitating. So Casey, are there any other treatment protocols that you've used since your now adult battle with Lyme disease um, that you found to be helpful on, on the last five years of your journey? I'm, I'm, I'm a vegetarian. And um, I believe in the past five years that I've became a vegetarian, um, that it has helped me immensely. It might not help somebody else, but for me, low gluten, low sugar, um, low gluten, I think is also extremely crucial for gut health. Um, I, I also believe in, in low sugar because I, I read, and it, it could be right, it could be wrong, that some of the bacteria feed off of high incidence of sugars in the body. So I tried to do a little bit of my research as far as um, eating a healthy diet went so that I knew what would exacerbate my Lyme disease and what could possibly, you know, make it a little bit better and a little bit more livable. So diet for me became a crucial element of my journey and, and my healing. So now let's talk about you as a fitness professional. You, uh, you had this experience as a, as a child where um, you were suffering from a disease that you knew required you to be fit. You went to an extreme uh, level of, um, of fitness uh, and again, you still look very fit despite you know, the challenges that you're, that you're facing. Um, talk to us about how your, your perspective on fitness has been transformed by uh, the experience that you've had over the last five years and how, and what recommendations you make to folks in the Lyme community about how they should use movement and exercise as part of their healing protocol. I have four words, find what feels good. Because what feels good to one Lyme patient might not to another. And any movement from yoga to a walk around your block to a bike ride to um, Tai Chi, Pilates, aquatics, whatever it is that resonates or feels good for your body, I encourage anybody to do it. Um, it does not have to be extreme. It can be moderate, but you know, shoot for that that thirty minute threshold, right? Just to get yourself moving. A, a great rule of thumb: after you have a meal, go for a walk, even if it's around your block. Just that movement is so imperative and 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 so important for the lubrication of your joints and 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 the, the pumping of the blood around your body and. Not to mention the mental, the mental, um, you know, uh, 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 the mental good that that fit, fitness brings, you know, the endorphins and all of that good stuff. But find what feels good and try to move. And some days are going to be easier than others, but uh, just know that there is going to be that thing that you can do that will help you stay fit, but that will also keep your Lyme disease hopefully at bay a bit. Right now, of course, we understand that detoxification is going to be a vital element of healing, and you're not going to be able to doc you're not going to be able to detox if you're not moving. So, what types of exercises would you recommend that folks try that would be moderate but would assist them with the movement elements of detoxing that would be necessary for healing? So, of course, coupled with you know good water intake, obviously during the detox, I think, um, like I mentioned, pool, aquatics, uh, aqua walking, aqua aqua size, you know, it's a non-jarring type of activity with no impact. So it cushions the bones, the joints, the muscles, cushions the whole body. Get in a pool. Join your you know your local YMCA if if you don't have access to an indoor pool. Um, again, walking um, is just the a, a great movement it's a natural motion and movement for the body it's it's it doesn't have to be super energetic or or um you know vigorous rigorous it, it just has to be motion or movement so walking is is wonderful um i've discovered yoga in the past few years i've never been a yogi but i just enjoy the release mentally um, I love the way that the stretching of my body feels, uh, especially with the arthritis. There are certain things I can't do, and that's okay. 
and, and I modify a lot. And that's what people need to remember that if something doesn't work, modification is key. Um, but I think, you know, those three things are, are just wonderful spaces and places to start with. Casey, we, we didn't spend a lot of time on the podcast talking about your life as a, as a mom and as a, and as a spouse. And, and I'd like to explore that with you a little bit before I turn you back over to Adina to ask, for her to ask the final question. Talk to us about how um, you've managed your disease as a parent and as a spouse, and how have you had to communicate with your family so that they could understand um, how, um, how you're feeling and how they can best help you to be um, to be as healthy as you can be. Oh, this might get me a little bit. I might get a little teary with this one. Um, I've been married almost 20 years. I have the most amazing husband who has been super supportive. We've known each other since we were children. So he's kind of known about my Lyme journey. Um, and it's been a very difficult road for him to see me go through all of this. But um, he's done everything he can to uh, support me and be there for me. My kids have seen a lot more than I wish they had seen. Um, but I think it's made them stronger. And I think it's made our relationship um, even more uh, special and wonderful because we know that time and life is precious and health is um, your wealth. <laughs> And uh, my kids, you know, they know all about tick safety. I think I mentioned my son is the one that pulled the tick out of my hip. And he knows now that um, tick check is part of the routine. So does my daughter. So I think um, my journey has turned on the light as far as um, knowledge and um, sensitivity, compassion, um, all of it. So I'm, I'm really blessed with amazing family and my mother who has stuck by me and slept in a hospital bed for weeks and, you know, was just with me yesterday when I had my hip aspirated because it's still going on. Um, you know, she's been unwavering in her love and support. So I've got great family. So okay, so let's talk about communication generally. One of the things we've learned from the two alpha gals who have a new podcast and they've been guests of ours is that the reason they've had the success that they've had on their journey is uh, they first learned how to communicate with one another and support one another through this journey as two people who are on, on this journey together. Then they learned how to communicate with their families and let their families know what it is that they were going through and what their needs were so that there was no guesswork and everybody could understand how they uh, could work together. And then of course, they, be, they, they had to communicate with the larger community of people that they're interacting with. And of course, because they have um, you know, an allergy that could, you know, cause them to be, become anaphylactic, um, you know, they have to always let everyone know what their needs are so they don't, they don't get sick. But the, I think, I think what's most important about the lessons that they're teaching folks in the community is that communication is really important. So give us a little more detail about how you're communicating with your husband, how you're communicating with your children, how you're communicating with the larger community of people that you interact with, so they understand what your needs are, and that makes your ability to have strong social relationships, uh, which are vital to, uh, to healing. I do use my social media now as a platform for change and an opportunity to get my story out. I encourage people who are walking through this to do the same if they are comfortable. I think social media is an amazing tool um, when used the right way to really educate people people who don't understand or have never been through what we've been through. Um, they, they know, it, my friends and, and, and family members know that if they have somebody in their life that has a tick, that um, you know, they can reach out to me or they, they know what I've walked through and they can kind of um, guide them on that journey. I've communicated a lot to my immediate uh, family that there are gonna be some days where I'm gonna have to hang out inside, gonna have to rest. Um, when I go to a restaurant, I gotta make sure that I have my options, vegetarian options, um, you know, plant-based meals. I'm really diligent about my own health so that I can be there for everybody else. And in doing that, I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty stern about 
where my borders and, and where my guidelines are physically and emotionally. And I have to be, I have to kind of preserve and protect myself a little bit right now. Um, because part of the healing journey is to make sure that you're being authentic to your own needs as a chronically ill person. And that can be really hard, but it is so important. Um, if you can't be real with yourself, I don't feel like you can be real with everybody around you. So if there are days that you need to give yourself some extra time, space, or seclusion, I think it's important to do that. So you, and thank you, that's a, a very powerful outline of the importance of setting boundaries so that folks can um, understand what your needs are and rather than allowing them or forcing them to guess about what we need, if we're communicating clearly with folks what in fact we do need, it allows us to have healthier relationships with everyone. So let's, let me talk to you about one last topic and then and then I'll let Adina ask you the final question is, let's talk about um, your body signals, right? Um, and how you learn to read body signals, because one of the things that we are exploring now on this podcast is, uh, is making sure that you read your body signals and you follow your body signals, right? And, 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 and I think you're, you're an important person to talk to about this because you're someone who has been, um, you know, a part of the suck it up culture. You've been a part of the extreme fitness culture. Um, and, and I'm wondering how you now that you're you know you're at the later stages of your life um look at reading body signals differently than you did as a as a young person because one of the things that we hear in this community all the time is well you know your body the best but you know you really need to build that out because i think that's become a little you know that that has become more of a quote than a meaningful tool right because on the one side of the coin, when we're going through treatment the way you are, you're going to Herx, and Herxing is an important signal to know that it's working for you, right? That 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 the bacteria and the viruses and the protozoa are being killed. On the other side of the coin, if you push yourself too hard, you can actually make yourself sicker, right? And I think part of your journey, you know, one of the highlights of your journey has been that perhaps you pushed yourself too hard at times. So what have you now learned as someone who is now um, older and wiser uh, about how to listen to your signals and when you should be pushing yourself and when you shouldn't? So seeing the um, evolution of the fitness industry and seeing how, like you said, we used to push and push and push, and that was considered you know, some sort of a badge of honor, right? this, you know, team, no days off stuff. I, I am, I'm, I'm really, I really wish that I um, knew then what I know now that that really doesn't get you anywhere, especially as a chronically ill person. I think it's so crucial to have balance, uh, days of rest, um, days of activity, and um, a lot of stuff in between, days where you get a really good night's sleep. And if that means going into your bedroom at eight o'clock at night, or seven o'clock at night, whatever, you know, whatever that looks like to you. I, I think that that culture of go, 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 go for somebody that's battling Lyme disease is, is pretty dangerous. I, 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 I hope that people will, um, will learn that listening to your body could mean, um, you know, uh, 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 less sugar, like we talked about, or uh, less activity, or more, more sleep, or more water, or because it looks different for, for, for each one of us, right? But listening to your body is so important when you're battling Lyme disease or any tick-borne disease, because your body is going to um, there's a correlation between how much we care for it to how much it can it can heal. And um, I think it's really important to know that your healing journey might look completely different from somebody else. Comparison, there's no room for that. You got to do what's right for you. That's such great advice, Casey. Uh, I will be honest, I'm one of those people who go, go, go. And my clinicians, even my 
my physical therapist, you know, says to do things in moderation, do things slowly, don't push yourself, don't feel guilty if you have to rest, right? We have to be able to do these things where we're not crashing and in bed sick for two to three days, you know, afterward. Yes. Yeah. So I have a last question for you. And thank you so much for sharing all of this great information with us and with the community. Um, there are so many people listening today who are struggling with their own health and who are caregivers to a tick-borne disease patient. And so many of us in the community have become advocates for awareness about the dangers of ticks. We typically preach to the choir when we're talking to the community, right, about, uh, you know, to the tick-borne diseases community who already know so much about prevention. So my last question is a little different and not targeted to our own community. What do you think will be the message? What do you think will be that tipping point for the general population to not be affected by ticks, for them to pay attention to this serious public health issue? I think they have to look around and see how many people they know who have been affected by tick bites, whether they know them personally or whether they know them through somebody else, a friend, a family member. Um, there are so many stories of individuals out there that um, have either battled Lyme disease or co-infections or both. And if, if, if somebody personally has never walked through it, I'm sure they know somebody who has. And if they don't, they probably will. It's not the end. Um, this is an epidemic in so many um, areas of this country in particular. Um, I think that the most important thing that people can do is be open-minded when it comes to learning about uh, tick-borne disease. Share your knowledge if you have it. Uh, share your experience. Um, educate people if you hear of something that's cutting edge that possibly could be working for somebody, share that with somebody who's battling. Um, we, we do a lot of mentor-mentee uh, type of, uh, of, of relationship within this community, and I think that's truly important. Um, caregivers of, of Lyme patients, I encourage you to just love them. Love them when they're down, love them when they're up, love them, you know, everywhere in between because they really do need it. They need compassion and they need sympathy and they need to be empowered. And we need to rally around this community and we need to bring to light um, everything that, that this community, um, you know, encompasses, which is education and hopefully one day a cure. Casey, we can't thank you enough for taking time from your family to share your beautiful story with the folks in our community. We know the folks are going to both be inspired and they're going to learn a number of different tools that are going to be helpful to them on their journey. Uh, and I also want to thank Adina and, uh, and the folks at Lime TV for lending Adina to us today for this special crossover podcast between uh, Tick Bootcamp and, and uh, Lime TV. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Tick Bootcamp interview with our guest, Casey Fillion. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Casey Fillion, please visit our Instagram page at C Fillion, C-F-I-L-L-I-A-N. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Bootcamp podcast, please share it with your friends by using the social media buttons you see at the bottom of our post. Third, Tick Bootcamp has created a Tick by Blueprint. It has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past guests on this podcast. We are due to visit our website at tickbootcamp.com to view our blueprint. Please note we'd appreciate any improvements or any input you would like to share with us. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. And finally, we thank your community for your comments on our past podcast episodes. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on Apple Podcasts, on Instagram, or on our website. We make it a point to read every single one of the reviews you share with us. Thank you, as always, for listening.